Welcome to a National Sheriff's Association's webinar. My name is Hillary Burgess and I'm with the NSA and will be your moderator today. Today's webinar, Protest on the Prairie, Law Enforcement Response and Lessons Learned, is presented by Sheriff Paul Laney of Cass County, North Dakota, and Mark Feisley, NSA's Communication and Crisis Management Advisor. Today's webinar will be about 90 minutes with the last 10 to 15 minutes reserved for a question and answer period. Please use the chat box on your screen to type in your questions. A couple additional housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar is being recorded and will be available in the webinar archives on sheriffs.org shortly after the presentation. The PowerPoint and a document of lessons learned are available for download in the box at the bottom of your screen. You can adjust your speaker volume by clicking on the little green speaker icon at the top of your screen. And lastly, at the end of the webinar, you will have the opportunity to download and print a certificate of attendance should you wish. Sheriff Laney, I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you, uh, Hillary, and welcome everybody. Uh, on behalf of Mark Feifley and myself, uh, we wanna thank you for uh, attending our uh, our webinar today on, on the Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, what we're gonna try to do over the next 90 minutes is uh, give you a power version of seven months of uh, what occurred out at the Dakota Access Pipeline, what we commonly refer to as DAPL. Uh, we had some other terms for it, but not appropriate for the webinar. We'll uh, just kinda, kinda give you an overview of everything that occurred. I'm gonna try to give you a historical overview uh, at the same time, really show you some detailed video of what occurred. And you're gonna, you're, as we talk about a lot of the lessons learned, you're gonna see a lot of what the, the media lessons learned were for us. That was probably one of the biggest lessons learned. And what was uh, broadcast out there through social media that really painted us, the, the painted the picture that we were a bunch of monsters uh, abusing people. And you're gonna find, I think when you see the video and you see the things that, uh, that it really truly occurred behind the scenes uh, you're going to see that uh, I believe that the law enforcement officers, uh, the North Dakota law enforcement officers, and those 10 other states that assisted us, uh, the restraint shown by those law enforcement show how professional law enforcement is in America. And as you can see by the first slide here, uh, August 10th is when uh, things began and when things initially kicked off. Uh, and, and just to give you a little bit of historical perspective, the first signs of protesters showing up was in April of 2016. And the Dakota Access Pipeline for the two years prior to that had been laying the groundwork, doing their permits, having their public hearings, doing everything they needed to do to properly be approved for their pipeline. Now at, at that point in time, like none of us in North Dakota law enforcement really even realized anything was going on. Maybe in, in Morton County they did, or the, the, the counties along the pipeline route probably knew there was some meetings being held, but never in our wildest imagination would we have ever thought what was about to happen to Morton County or to our state was a reality. And as I said, in April, uh, Sheriff Kirkmeyer and his personnel started seeing the beginnings of some people setting up a little camp out on the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineer land, which is just north of the Standing Rock Reservation. Many of the people uh, that had arrived there initially were either from out of state or had some ties to the Standing Rock people, but it was a small group of people that set up some camps, set up some tents uh, in area that is, they're not authorized to do so. The land is not reservation land. It's U.S. Army Corps of Engineer land, which is federal property. And then what started occurring is at the beginning of August, the company, once all their permits and had all their approval, began moving equipment into an area about 29 miles south of, uh, of where Standing Rock is. And, and or I'm sorry, where Mandan is, just north of the Standing Rock Reservation and north of that U.S. Army Corps of Engineer land. It was on private property uh, owned by uh, David Meyer and the Cannonball Ranch. And the screen you just saw come up in front of you now is uh, the time frame between like August 10th and August 15th 
where protesters started to show up as they were moving the equipment. And as you see the road uh, that, that moves in, that road is actually uh, just, just west of it or to the left of your screen is Highway 1806. And the road as that little passenger road that goes in there um, is the access road that goes onto the private property uh, and now stretches probably about a mile and a half from there to the Missouri River. And that road that you're looking at right there is actually the path of the pipeline. It's actually right through there ultimately is where the pipeline was going to go. So around that August 10th time frame, they brought in a caterpillar, a couple other pieces of heavy equipment, and we're going to start moving some of the dirt and getting staged ready to start uh, late, bringing the pipe in. And they were met by resistance. They were met by a number of protesters who started standing in the, in front of the equipment. They started blocking the access to the road. They started uh, basically, you know, in a lot of ways, becoming very hostile with the workers and the drivers. So at that time, Sheriff Kirkmeyer uh, was notified, and he, along with some, some troopers from the North Dakota Highway Patrol and some area law enforcement, went down there started working with the people that were there, and they were told that uh, they weren't going to let them bring the equipment in. As you can see in this picture, uh, just to the, to the south of the entryway, there's a line of state troopers there. And this video that I'm going to play for you now will kind of, kind of uh, show you what happened and, and how intense it got. Really, this laid the groundwork, and we should have seen coming what was going to start coming our way here in the future. Now, this video... I believe was taken on August 15th, and that video uh, will show um, the beginnings of this protest and the protest movement. And these uh, riders are, are, maybe there's some there from Standing Rock, from what I understand, a lot of them from, are from other reservations down in South Dakota. Uh, they brought in a group of horses, and this is, uh, this is what happened. Uh, we had audio a bit ago. I hope. Uh, do we have audio, Hillary? As you can see, and I and I hope the audio on your end was working, uh, folks. Uh, from there was a lot of war whoops, a lot of. Uh, of charging at the officers, and I don't know about any of you, but you got 1,200 pound of horse coming at you with a very irritated rider. It's a pretty scary moment. And if you look at the, you know, what the troopers and the deputies did at that point, they just backed up onto the uh, the road, but they did not engage. They did not use any force. And, and I think two things were shown there: the aggressiveness of the protesters and what we could expect in the coming months, and the restraint used by the troopers and the deputies at that point even though they were being charged uh, in a couple cases, they were trying to count coup, which uh, means they were trying to touch the, uh, the uh, troopers and the deputies on the shoulder with coup sticks. If you know Native American history, that's a, that's a big thing. And, and so it kind of set the stage uh, for what we were going to expect and what was going to happen uh, in the future. This was the day where, where my office, the Cass County Sheriff's Office, uh, we actually came in and rolled into town about eight hours later from this. Uh, how we were initially notified was on the, the two days prior on August 13th, Sheriff Kirkmeyer had put a call out for assistance to uh, a, a number of the agencies uh, in the area and had asked if, uh, if we could uh, give him a hand with, uh, with the incident and whether we could bring some deputies. Now, I have a, a strong critical incident management background. I have the largest department in the state of North Dakota. I am 180 miles to the east of Sheriff Kirkmeyer, uh, based out of Fargo, is where we're headquartered. And that's what happened uh, at that time when we, uh, just before we rolled in, this incident had occurred. And that night we received the briefing that, um, that they'd been charged with the horses and that they had now grown from about 50 or 60 protesters to about 300 protesters. And over that time frame, over the next few months, what we saw was the buildup then of the people um, that were going to start coming at us, were going to start 
uh, interfering with uh, the traffic, with the, the things that were occurring uh, on uh, the road. They would randomly go out and start start the shutting down traffic on Highway 1806. There were times where we would have over 300, 400, 500, 600 people just randomly go out onto the interstate and start blocking traffic. And because of that, we had to start setting up uh, traffic control points. We had to start setting up, uh, you know, where we had to start rerouting all the traffic in the area. And of course, they made a big deal out of that on social media saying that we were now uh, harassing them. We were, you know, uh, they, they started turning it into a social media campaign where you need to come to Standing Rock and stand with us. You know, now they're cutting us off from, from necessities. And, and at that point, we weren't. We were trying to protect them. And we very much wanted them to not get hit by a vehicle. I mean, that's a major thoroughfare, Highway 1806 runs uh, north-south down into South Dakota, and it's a major thoroughfare for commercial transportation, semis uh, galore coming through, people traversing the country, going from North Dakota uh, south to South Dakota or Nebraska, and they would randomly come over a hill and there'd be you know, four or 500 people in the middle of the road. And so we had to start diverting traffic. And we tried to work with them. We tried to say, listen, if you're gonna do this kind of thing, at least communicate with us and we'll try to start you know, redirecting, they wouldn't do that. The only way that we knew it was happening is our aircraft overhead would start uh, flying over the area and would tell us, hey, they just they got 400 people on 1806 and we'd call out, shut down traffic. And, but you know, keep in mind, we're 20 miles away from where that's happening is where the TCP is at, the traffic control point, and it, you know, traffic that had already come through, then we had to worry that they were gonna come roaring over that hill. So we always had to have people out there trying to slow people down, trying to, to get the message out that, um, that uh, we, you know, when you come down there, you, you may be stopped, you may be, um, you know, your, your, your passage or your, your, your transition might be hindered. Uh, and oftentimes we'd have them stopping people, face masks on, except their own roadblocks, their own, uh, you know, checkpoints per se. And when in Amer where in America is that okay that you roll up and, and four people wearing face masks stop you, ask you where you're going, and then make you turn around? And that's where we really started seeing the type of escalation we were going to have and the type of situation this this was going to be. And so as time went on, we started seeing a, a, a lot of issues where they would not come north anymore because the traffic control point was there. But what they began to do was they began to uh, randomly line up vehicles. We'd see situations where they would say, "We, I see, uh, you know, they got the, the, the pilot would tell us we have 40 vehicles lining up in the camp. Uh, we have 80 vehicles lining up in the camp. We have 120 vehicles lined up in the camp and they'd be packed to the gills with people. They would come out of that encampment now that had grown by this point to, to quite a few thousand people. People were answering the call. They, they believed the social media stories that we were abusing people. And, and this was, you know, the, 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 this pipeline was this evil thing that was crossing native land and, 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 and going through areas uh, that were sacramental to, to the tribes and that they, it was, you know, the water source was gonna be damaged. And none of that was true. The pipeline was going through private property uh, two to three miles north of the reservation. And this camp that was set up was not set up on reservation land. It was set up illegally on federal property on U.S. Army Corps land. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the current president of the United States and at that time um, did nothing to assist us in moving them off federal property and in many, many, many cases hindered any effort we made to try to, to move them off the property or, or to shut down that I illegal camp. So what they would start doing then is they would start um, lining up in those convoys and they would roll out and what they would do is they would go south onto the reservation, then they would come west across Highway 24, which is on the reservation. Then they would go about six, to, six miles or so to the west and then they would come north of Highway 6 and they would work their way up Highway 6 and they would look for the path of where the pipeline was at. 
And along that area, there would be called what they called access roads, which were basically what you saw in that one picture, uh, an access built in off the highway where the heavy equipment could go in and lay the next, you know, three, four, five miles uh, of pipe, uh, you know, move the dirt and do what they needed to do to lay the pipeline. And they would call them access roads. And at that time, along those access roads, uh, they would then stop and, and stand along the top of the, the roadway and they would start doing these ceremonies and they'd start filming themselves live for social media, having these prayerful, peaceful ceremonies, as they would say. And that's what they would film. And then when they were ready to, to, to move, they would move down in, in mass, you know, four or five, 600 people would move in mass down the, the access roads and they would come onto the private property and they would go to the machinery. If the operator of the machinery wouldn't get off, they would, they would force them off the machinery. If they felt there was any resistance whatsoever, they would beat up uh, and assault the, the private workers. Uh, and keep in mind, you know, they had this, you know, these Dakota Access Pipeline workers, they would paint them as these big monsters from Texas who were here destroying North Dakota. This was Joe Citizen, who lives in South Mandan, who works for a heavy equipment company, and they got subcontracted to go move some dirt. And these were the people that they were assaulting. I know of one point where, in a short period of time, they put three of these workers had to go to the hospital to be treated. Uh, at one point, they assaulted a guy, and they carried him, four of them picked him up and carried him over uh, 100 yards, and they disguised it by putting a banner up, to, uh, hiding the four people that were carrying them, and they brought them over into this dirt hole and threw them down in the hole. And what they were going to do, we don't know, because by then, a rescue team uh, led by a captain from the state patrol was able to come roaring in and interfere and intercept them. And then when you saw them on social media that night, their, their big thing was, we, you know, we were peacefully protesting, and we sniffed out this guy, and, uh, you know, and our security took action. And in real life, they had invaded private property on private person's land, assaulted a private worker, and then made it look like they were innocently minding their own business and they sniffed out this guy. And people believed it. And people would, and, and so then what they would show was us doing the arrest or taking people into custody. And, um, and they would snip out the parts where they had gone down and did all that. So what you'd see on social media is a people prayerful, peaceful prayerful protest. And then a few minutes later, you would see us wrestling people or people fighting with us. And it made it look like we'd gone into their ranks and while well, they were, you know, peacefully assembling in a public area along the road when it was, couldn't be no further from the truth. They had invaded in, they would come after our officers. They would, throw, uh, they would, you know, launch uh, bottles at our people, logs at our people. They would throw, uh, they would launch uh, marbles and bolts and nuts from wrist rockets at our people, uh, you know, bouncing them off their chest, off their helmet, and then they'd turn around on social media and look at the big, bad militarized police force uh, wearing their helmets and all their gear when all we're doing is peacefully assembling. Uh, in one case, uh, one of the captains of the highway patrol that was down there on the line had human feces thrown into his face, uh, and it was, you know, most of it hit his, his mask of his helmet. Uh, and so it's pretty obvious why we mandated our people wear protective gear, but what was sold in the media was these big militarized law enforcement entities suppressing these First Amendment rights of the protesters, and nothing could be further from the truth. And some of the things that they would do is they would um, mandate that regular press, the, the normal press, couldn't be, couldn't be there or shouldn't be there. And, and um, they, you had to have one of their press passes if you were going to cover their endeavor, if you were going to cover that day's whatever their, their uh, attack was that day. So if other media would show up. Uh, K Fire, which is a legitimate, uh, t you know, a news outlet out of Bismarck, had their their people assaulted basically and escorted out. Uh, they did a story on it. You could just the explicit language, the threats of being beaten up if they tried to come down there. And if you didn't have one of their press passes, you'd get escorted out. And this video I'm showing. Uh, is um, 
is uh, was uh, hopefully they showed where they escorted them. It looks like I might have had a little technical difficulty there, but we'll move on um, uh, onto slide four here. Oh, there we go. I think it was, it's coming now here. And you'll notice they're walking over, and they're going to see this person. He's a legitimate camera person for a local outlet, and he doesn't have one of their press passes. So they escort him out of the area. That happened all the time. And I think there you can get a good feel for, you see he tries to walk back. And whatever it was that was said at that point, but if you did not have one of their press passes, you were escorted out. And if you were legitimate news media, they didn't want the truth to come out because it would, it would um, dissuade everything that was, Okay, I have a little technical difficulty. I think we've solved it here. So what would happen, as I said, they would they would proceed down all of these access roads. And, and this didn't just happen once. Like what I'm showing you on that one picture wasn't just one day. It wasn't just one event or one thing that happened on uh uh, on our, our on during on our time frame or, or on the things that happen, it happened every day. So basically, starting from mid to late August into September, up and through into mid mid October until we pushed them off uh, as part of an area. They would go out every day and they would hit these access roads because the way it would work is you know the pipeline is slowly working its way. Uh, they had sometimes would go out 80 or 90 miles to find these pipeline routes and to find where. Uh, the workers were at and go after them. So it was a big chess game for us, and the only way we could track them was through our aircraft. And, and then, of course, you'd see on social media, they're, you know, they're harassing us with the aircraft. We're just peacefully assembling uh, within our uh, camp, and we're having ceremonies and prayer, and they're disrupting us with this helicopter and disrupting us with this airplane. No, we were monitoring because what they were doing was planning. They go into the sanctity and protection of that large camp, which – as the months grew by, grew up to over around 10,000 people. And, and while 90% of them were peaceful and prayerful, the 10% that was openly confrontational, that, you know, that five to 600 people that would come out looking for a fight uh, would go in and plan within the safety of that federal land, that big camp, and would then uh, come out and plan their attack and then come after the, the next access road. And that, like I said, that what happened every single day for uh, a couple months. And so at one point here, we decided to um, kind of call it for what it was. You know, we one of the lessons learned, and Mark will probably talk about this a little bit when we get to the media, is we were North Dakota nice. We always took the high road on everything because that's what we do. And, you know, we really didn't challenge their, their misbehaviors. We would answer things. We put out our press releases. But what we realized we had to start doing uh, was start calling it for what it was. And after some consultation with the incident command, with Sheriff Kirkmeyer, with the, the unified command, it was decided that I, as an, I, I held the role as operations chief, uh, would go tell everybody and tell the world uh, what, what it was that happened. That was their big thing. The eyes of the world are upon you. Um, and so we said, let's let the world see it for what it is. And this was the press conference we did that day.
people on TV can show you that's true. And that's why. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next what would happen then, and, if, and what we started seeing happening is they would now show up at the courthouse to support, to support, to support. their people. And, that, and, and, and this happened literally daily. So once we would finish uh, our field force lines, wherever they might be, we'd have to detach officers and deputies and troopers to to zip back to the courthouse and then set up a field force line uh, at the courthouse because then they would want to come and support their people. And this is what would greet us then every day as they would come out. So we'll move, on from, we'll move on from there. One of the things that would happen, and you probably just saw that young gal uh, in the maroon looking at us, they would uh, they would uh, set up a police line or a police liaison to come to the front of the line, and that's the person then that would just would talk with us. We try to set some parameters. The problem was a quarter of the people in the group would listen to her. The other group, like some of them would say, you're white, why are we listening to you? You aren't telling us what to do. And then another faction would say, you're not from our group. We don't care what you're saying. We're not gonna cooperate. So we never really had one person that we could work with uh, the, for, the, for the entire event. And so a, a big part of, of that was just a constant every single day for a couple of months, that was our, our day. So we deal with them out on an access road site we might make you know, 20, 30 arrests, that type of thing. Uh, you know, they brought out their celebrities. That's where you started seeing uh, you know, Shailene Woodley and Mark Ruffalo and all these people starting to stand behind this movement. Uh, that last one where you saw at Access Road 118 there, we basically had a mini riot there. And Shailene Woodley was one of the major instigators. She was ordered numerous times to leave the property, numerous times. Uh, that she was trespassing, uh, she was told that, she'd laugh and say, oh, you sound so convincing, I'm so scared. And, and she was placed under arrest. And so we had that happen every single day and we had to just kind of guess as to where they were gonna be and uh, where it was gonna happen. And as this went on then over the, the, income, the coming months, what you saw was the pipeline slowly getting closer to that area where you saw initial horse charge because now the pipeline's working its way towards where the, at this point, about 8,000 protesters are at in the camp. And we, you can just feel the confrontation brewing and you can just feel things happening and starting to happen. And we knew when it got to that point where it, the, the pipe got to 1806 and we were at the point of it gonna have to cross, it was gonna come to a head. And, and keep in mind, out all this time on this private land, the private owners are saying, get them off my property. Because what had happened now is a, another element of the protesters had come north um, to uh, confront where the, the, the route of the pipeline. So right where you saw those horses at, initially in the early probably 15 days of this, we probably had 20 tents. And in uh, a couple little permanent structures, they started building uh, right there. They built a, a permanent little fortified, uh, almost like a fort 
right in the path on, on the road, on the uh, access road there. And then uh, they built, there was about 20 to 30 tents. Well, as the months went by, and it started, they started realizing this pipe is going to get to this location, they moved about 200 people up, and then they took over private property. They actually crossed the fence and went onto the private property, and about 200 protesters put themselves right in the path of the pipeline, right in the path of the workers. But this time they weren't on U.S. Army Corps of Engineer land, and they certainly weren't on tribal land. They were on the Cannonball Ranch, which was a private North Dakota resident who then ended up selling the property, just had had enough of the harassment and had enough of it. He ended up selling it to Dakota Access Pipeline. So not only did they have the leasing rights, it was their property. And as like any other property owner in the, in, in the United States, uh, they, you know, if they're, if they're, they have criminal activity on their, on their property, they call the police and the pressures were on us for, for many months, get them off here, get them off here, get them off here. And we finally got to the point we had tried negotiations for months. We'd met with the tribe. We met with tribal leadership. We met with camp leadership. Everybody kind of kept putting it off on the other, who's in control of the camps, who's in charge. Um, there was never really ever one person that could control anything. And they tried to make it look early on like Chairman Archambault could. He, he was not controlling the camps, and he would tell us one thing in a meeting and then say something else in another. Uh, there was really nobody speaking for the whole camp because you had so many different factions in there. You had the tribal leadership uh, or the tribal people from Standing Rock that obviously had a vested interest. This, you know, They were the ones that really truly had a voice in this and their voice got drowned out by all the people that invaded and took over. You had the what we call the eco-terrorist groups out of the Pacific Northwest uh, who very much wanted direct action, very much wanted confrontation, very much were looking for a fight. Uh, you had some of the, 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 the AIM group out of South Dakota, uh, the Oglala Red Warrior group who openly called for confrontation. There was numerous times on video we watched them actually conflicting with each other with groups that said keep it peaceful and prayerful and the other groups saying that's not what we're here to do. We're only gonna gonna get this done through violence. And you know, the peaceful and prayerful group, if they would have been able to maintain and manage this entire thing, we never would have had to leave the borders of Cass County and all the other jurisdictions that we had to come from because it would have been peaceful and prayerful. But that's six hundred or so protesters that turned it violent, um forced the hand of all of us and, and forced us into a situation where it was very, very spooky some days. And how we got out of this without somebody getting hurt or killed, I don't know. But it's, uh, you know, I would say obviously the restraint and the professionalism of the law enforcement officers that were down there were, were a major reason for that. So as we started getting closer, and the pipe is now probably just a mile over the hill to the west uh, from from the 1806 and, and that access road and then about you know two miles north of the camp uh it came to a head and on october 27th of 2016 uh well let me jump back on october 26th of 2016 we went down for one last negotiation because now they had not only moved those 200 people into the path of the pipeline of the private property they went about another mile north and made barricades out of abandoned cars tree trunks, branches, any kind of tires, anything they could do to put barricades out in front of us. And they basically just shut down a state highway and said, this is our turf now. You're not coming through here. And they did that in a couple of different locations where they built these big barricades. So we went down one last time and tried to say, you know, um, you need to go back. We're not even trying to kick you out of the main camp. If, if, the Obama administration isn't going to kick you off federal property, and if the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is not going to kick you off their property, that's their business, you know, then go back there. We're not trying, we're not going to come into the camps, we're not going to come push you off there, but you have to leave the private property. We tried to compromise, we tried to negotiate, we tried uh, to just try to have some common sense as the thing, because the last thing we wanted was a confrontation. Nobody wins in a violent confrontation ever. And so we uh, also, though, uh, we said started learning our lessons. We started bringing our media with. We started bringing and filming everything that we do. 
And and we went down and because we knew that the negotiators down there or the, 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 the representatives that have built all these barricades and won the fight would probably tell us that they weren't going to move, they weren't going to compromise. And, and but we wanted to try one last time. And at the same time, we wanted to, as they'd always say, the world is watching. Well, we wanted the world to see we're not the confrontational ones. We're trying everything we can as law enforcement and as North Dakota government to end this peacefully. And, and it didn't, and they did not, um, they did not uh, back off. In fact, uh, the individual who was kind of the leader of the group uh, made the comment, Highway 1806 is our line in the sand and we are not moving. And I said, that's your final word? He said, that's, your, that's our final word. I said, okay then. And we left and the next day we gave the order to, uh, to move on October 27th. We had over 400 law enforcement officers. We had to come from two different directions because they blocked off that where Highway 134 also comes in and meets up just south of the private land and just north of the camps. They had overtaken a bridge uh, and it was an area where they could have got around behind us. So we had to come from two different directions. Uh, we knew there were weapons in the camp. We'd seen pictures of weapons in the camp. You're not going to have 10,000 people in a camp and not think we don't have intelligence and surveillance going on within that camp. And so we knew it could be very violent, and we knew that there were definitely a faction that was looking for a fight. And so we geared our people up. We had our armored vehicles for protection. We did just a slow, methodical move, and we went down. We met the first barricade, had to move our way past that, and we put our people uh, online across 1806 onto the private land, and we started moving south. And I think to show the restraint that our officers and deputies and troopers showed is that those, those people, those 400 cops from 10 different states, uh, took over eight hours to go 2.1 miles. And I think that shows you how methodical we were. So as you look at some of the next photos I'm gonna show you here, um, this is a photo from above where you actually see the skirmish line starting to form uh, as we start moving south. And you can see, you know, the vehicles out in front of us and the people putting things in our way. And then you can see our, our armored vehicles and our officers as they start to move. Peaceful and prayerful, huh? That's what met us as soon as we got to the first barricades. They torched them and put a wall of fire up in front of us. And then they just started launching uh, things at us. They started launching um, everything from rocks, bottles, burning logs. We had one of our one of the deputies from a, from a different county got hit in the shoulder with a burning log. He had to go in for treatment. His whole left side had gone numb at some point. Uh, thank God everything came back. His feeling came back and he was fine. But these are the kind of things that met us uh, in, down in that area. If you look at the bottom, you'll see two five-ton trucks there that we had purchased from military surplus, and we were just gonna use them as a barricade because our whole goal with this entire event was to just get down to the, bre to, uh, to the bridge that was just south of the, the private property. And, and I, I don't have a visual of that for you. You'll see it here in a little bit, but north of the camps, and south of the private property is, is a waterway area that's a backwater wash area for the floods and, and uh, off the Missouri River. And once you got to that bridge, you were off the private property. So our whole goal that day was just to push the protesters south of that bridge and then seal it and protect it, the private property to the north and then use the water as natural barrier lines to, to protect you know, basically everybody from uh, those that wanted to attack to, the, to, to go north, and it kept you know, the workers and everybody else from doing cut access separate from the protesters. And we just wanted to put this great big wall of cops in between so nobody could get hurt. And you can see what they did to the, there was two of those vehicles parked, kind of, uh, just kind of abutted up to each other. And within five minutes of them being there, they were completely burned and torched. There's another picture where uh, you can just see the chaos is where the line starts moving south those are all abandoned vehicles, vehicles that they left in front of us. I don't know if they just thought we would bypass things or we would just go past things, but we didn't. 
uh, we ended up impounding, uh, I, can't even, I can't remember how many cars that day, but numerous, numerous cars. Like, yeah, it was, I know the total uh, impound fees on the, all the cars was $40,000. And one of the protesters, their money guy, we used to say, hey, money man's here, came down, dropped up $40,000 down and bailed them all out that day. Also that day, with after all the arrests, dropped down $180,000 and bonded all them out. So they have money. They have access to a lot of money. And as you can see from the protest lines, if you look at that picture down on the lower left there, the man in the plaid, you know, just standing right in front of our people, putting barricades, putting walls of people, putting walls of fire uh, in front of our people. And we just had to slowly, methodically move them back. And all we wanted to do was get to the bridge uh, and then we were going to seal it off and, and the day's events were over. So uh, here's a few more pictures. You can see the field force line. You can see the abandoned car they put in front of us. You can see another wall of all that wood and debris. As we get close, then you can look down to the lower right, and that's what they'd do. They'd torch it. And then we would have to worry, one, about what was in there, two, get the fire department up uh, behind us and put out all the fires, and then slowly move our way again back down the line. At one point, we get to um, an area where they, we see six riders go over the hill and to the, to the west of, I'm sorry, to the east of us. So if you're standing behind the protest line, looking towards our officers and our field force line, the private property that, that where you're looking at these buffalo is to the right, is to the east, towards the river. And, and on that David Meyer ranch, on that Cannibal ranch, there's a, head, a herd of uh, 600 head of buffalo. And they are owned by the rancher. That's it's his private herd. And six riders on horseback uh, headed up into the hills, rounded up these buffalo, and started a stampede towards, the, towards our lines. And so as we're looking at the protesters, the stampede would have been coming from our left towards us. And this just shows in, in, in when the, the, the stampede started, you could see protesters going up to the fence, standing by the fence lines, screaming and hollering and cheering them on and cheering for them uh, to come in. And this shows you how radical and, and how crazy their thought process was because it's not like the buffalo come over the hill at a full stampede and say, okay, where's the cops in uniform? We're only going to get them. You know, you have a conglomeration of thousands of people. You've got 400 cops on one line, and 20 yards away facing them, you have thousands of protesters. The, the, the bison herd isn't going to pick and choose its target. It was going to mow them all over. And this was probably, I will say, as the operations chief, probably the most scared I was initially that day. I mean, we were always worried about snipers, and we were always worried about that. But to see that happening and unfolding in front of us, uh, that probably took 10 years off my life. And I, I got on the radio, and I just started screaming at our, at our HP pilot to cut them off, you know, cut off the herd. And he said, you want me to take the herd or the riders? And I yelled, cut the riders off from the herd, cut them off. And at the same time I was giving orders, we, we had uh, radio contact with my assistant beside me to, to the helicopter to head off the herd, turn the herd. And that, to me, and, and, and I'm certainly hoping I'm going to make sure he gets duly recognized, the pilot of that Cessna, that Cessna um, came down to about 50 feet and went head on at the riders and was able to disperse them. And at the same time, you can see the helicopter as it's dipping down, going to the right, heading off the herd. And, and diverted it from coming into our ranks. I can't even fathom the, the carnage that would have happened had that herd charged into the lines. And uh, those, two, those pilots are heroes. And uh, then if you look in the lower left, there was a, a snapshot from one of the protesters. You can see our SWAT team guys in U UTVs. Uh, that's, uh, that's a squad of SWAT guys going after the riders. We were able to take all six riders into custody and impound all six UTVs. So... Uh, pretty tense and pretty scary for a while, uh, but in the end, uh, thank you know, thank God for some heroic pilots and uh, and the good Lord looking over our shoulder that day. As we started moving down the line, 
and started moving. By now we're getting probably three quarters of the way done. And it's still very confrontational and still very, 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 um, very well, very confrontational and very tense. And you're going to see the, the picture of the lady in, in you're going to see the picture of the woman in orange garb. Uh, that's Red Fawn Phallus. And Red Fawn uh, that day had been very confrontational. She'd been walking the line the whole time, getting in people's faces, uh, very militant, very confrontational, very riotous. At some point, the, the team leaders there decided she needs to be arrested. So using field force tactics, the next time she came up and got in the face, they, the line split apart, pulled her in behind the line. The rest team's members came in, got a hold of her. She had both of her hands in her jean jacket or in a, in a jacket, and she started to fight. She wouldn't take her hands down, started getting combative, so they took her and assisted her down to the ground and kept trying to pull her hands out of her pocket. And they got the one hand out of her, out of her, pocket, out of her pocket, brought that around behind her to get the handcuff on. They pull the other hand out. They finally get it out. And she's holding a 38 revolver, and she starts cracking off rounds into the crowd of officers. She cracked off three rounds. One of them went through like a pants leg of a, of a Pennington County, South Dakota deputy, or right near his leg. Another one went over the shoulder of one of the state troopers, and the other one went into the dirt. And how that didn't hit uh, a, a law enforcement officer or go back to the protest lines, I have no idea. And um, I'm going to play that video for you now, so it's a little bit long. Uh, but right at the end, listen and watch very carefully. You'll hear the three rounds crack off, and then you'll see the protesters react. They blame us and tell us that, and they think that we're shooting her when, in fact, uh, she put three rounds into the ranks of the law enforcement officers. And here it is. So if you watch here to the right now, start watching very carefully. There you go. And so you see the rash, you can see the, the three gunshots, you can see her in the blue jeans there. And obviously, you know, you talk about the restraint. She used force, deadly force on them, and they did not overreact. And that takes some serious patience. So I'm going to move on to the next video here. And I did see one question come in uh, from David Brand. Uh, did the governor declare a state of emergency per EMAC rules? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Morton County Sheriff uh, uh, you know, requested the Morton County uh, Commission uh, declared a state of emergency, which was then followed by Governor Dan, Dal Ripple in the state of North Dakota, uh, which then obviously kicks in the ability to, to utilize EMAC. And so we uh, definitely had... Um, uh, the, all, all the I's dot and the T's crossed for that, and that is definitely one of our, our messages to anybody out there. Uh, there are definitely areas I know, we know of, you know, in South Dakota, Nebraska, and Minnesota that this is all pending, and have your, have your dec emergency declarations ready to go, uh, because when they start kicking off, this is going to go fast. So this next slide is um, is a slide where, and it's kind of kicked into gear here. I didn't want it to go yet, but uh, is as we you can see now that it started to turn dark, 
And as we moved down towards the backwater bridge, you know, we dealt with the incident, we had red fawn in custody, and we started pushing the lines back. We had another incident where a private security guard uh, was accosted by the, the uh, he had gone over to check on some of the burning equipment. He had kind of disguised himself as one of them because his boss made him go in there. Well, they realized and they stopped him. They abducted, basically abducted him. He grabbed an AR-15 out of his, uh, out of his vehicle and he uh, backed himself down into the water. They chased him into the water. They fired a flare gun his way. They stole his pickup, brought it up onto Highway 1806 where it met with 134. And in front of our, our officers, they torched uh, and completely burned out his pickup. Uh, BIA was able to get in there and rescue him and get him out of there and, um, and get him to safety. So as we move and continue pushing, and it's now moving on into darkness, and if you look at the screen that, you, that you're looking at, you can see, you can see, the, you can see the, uh, the people on the bridge, that's the protesters, and you can see the, uh, the flare up, that big, big bright spot just off the bridge, that's where they torched those two vehicles that we had dropped uh, that we were gonna secure the bridge with. And that's how hot they're burning. What you're looking at is forward looking infrared uh, from, uh, from, a, 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 from an air asset. And then you see all those vehicles to the left, that is um, our people, that's our line, that's our armored vehicles. And then behind that line is all of our people. What I want you to watch very, very carefully is watch the top of the big fire and what gets launched at us. Here they come. Molotov cocktails. They ended up throwing and launching four Molotov cocktails at our location. I'm going to play that one more time. As if anybody recently was watching the protests in France, you saw those Police officers get fully engulfed in flames, exact same thing that was just thrown at us. It is not beneath them at all to use that kind of deadly force against you. And in the rhetoric that we're seeing and in, in a lot of the, the intel areas that we're still following, even though our event is over, we're hearing a lot about violence is how we're going to solve this. And it's time, you know, we need to shut them down. Um, during this time and during all of this at the same time, we also had uh, numerous threats occurring on our families, numerous events and, and, and things uh, happening uh, where they were trying to dissuade law enforcement from staying actively engaged. And um, so Trying to go to my next slide here, but it doesn't look like he wants to clear out of it. Oh, there we go. I think I need to be more patient, so I apologize, people. Um, so as we move into our next slide here, uh, throughout this time frame, uh, there, like I said, there was a number of threats towards our people. A lot of, a lot of, you know, trying to dissuade us uh, from this. Now, this was October 27th, and over over the next month, then we had to deal with a number of protests uh, within the city limits of, of Bismarck, Mandan. They would go down and they would go to the, to the places where they felt that we, um, you know, or, or where we wouldn't be, they would go to the places like the Wells Fargo Bank, which was one of the banks on a national level that had helped uh, finance, apparently finance, uh, the pipeline, and they would try to shut down operations at those banks. And we'd have to always try to predict where they were going to go, what they were going to do. They would try to split our forces. We'd hit the bank, and then they'd go hit the federal building, which was really ironic on a side note that we would have, you know, zero federal help. The federal government told us, we are not coming to help. The Obama administration opposes pipelines, and you're not getting any help whatsoever. And they didn't. We got, we got zero federal help. Our state senators and our congressmen both tried everything they could. Our U.S. attorney, Chris Myers, was an absolute rock star. He did everything he could to try to get us help, and it fell on deaf ears. Our U.S. marshal, who has since retired, tried the same thing, and it fell on deaf ears. But then they would take over the federal building and on the main level, and who would have to go in? We would go in and, and protect the federal building. So 
there was just a lot of sometimes you just shake your head and and, and say, is this really happening? But it, it was really happening. So uh, this next one I'm going to show you here is now we've moved up through November 20th. Uh, and over that month from the 27th to the November 20th, that three weeks to a month, every day we were responding within the city limits of Bismarck and Mandan. They went, one day they put a, a car across railroad tracks and started to burn the car to try to stop trains coming in. I mean, this is how peaceful and prayerful they were. They would, uh, and, and so we were constantly responding code three, uh, and they would come in with hundreds and hundreds of, you know, we're not talking 10 protesters, we're talking 600, 700, and they would try to split our forces. And then on Sunday, November 20th, uh, was a was a major, major day. And I know this one, for some reason, we aren't going to have audio, but you'll get a, a feel for what happened, and I'll try to lay it out for you. Our people, uh, it was a Sunday night, which was usually our transition night for new officers coming in and others going home uh, if they were on the seven-day rotation. And they came in force. They w were going to get the bridge back, because if you could get the bridge back, you could get direct access to where the pipeline was coming across, they could get direct access to the drill pad, and on each side of that river were two $20 million drills, which if they could destroy them, they certainly could slow down the pipeline, and that was what they intended to do. Not only that, they could have got behind the ranks of our, of our people, and then we would have had to defend ourselves from the front and the back, and anybody that has any basic tactical knowledge knows that's a nightmare. And, and so where our line was on the bridge, and then just to the east there, about a, a mile, half mile to mile, as the crow flies was what was called Turtle Hill. And we held those two locations. And by holding those two locations, they couldn't get around behind us. Well, on Sunday night, November 20th, they came for us. And they, they started initially with uh, backing a semi-tractor trailer up to the bridge on the south side and started yanking the barricades off one by one, the big jer cement jersey barriers we had there. And then working their way, they hooked up to one of the big burned out trucks, which was still working as a, a barricade for us. And they yanked that about a quarter of a mile down the road. Uh, and then they started a bunch of fires right on the other side of our line. So we had Morton County rural fire on scene. And you heard all these and probably saw all these social media posts about how we are uh, – using these water cannons. Well, there's not a water cannon in the state of North Dakota, and no law enforcement agency in North Dakota owns a water cannon. They were standard rural fire department fire hoses, and they were being used to put out the fires. Well, as the protesters started charging towards the line to get through, the, the fire hose would keep them back. And they, we, our people quickly realized, hey, this is the least amount of force. We don't have to hit them with beanbag rounds. We don't have to, at least initially, we don't have to hit them with stabilizer rounds. We don't have to be launching uh, gas yet. We can just use the water and keep them back. Well, of course, they turned into this, that into a inhumane, it's freezing out, why are you wetting us down? Well, you know, my mom taught me very early at a young age, if I'm cold in the water, come out of the damn water. And, um, and they all they could would have done is turn around and walk about 50, 60 yards backwards, and they never would have got wet. But that's what we were up against on the social media end of it, but also was very, very effective. And initially, we were able to, to just utilize that least amount of force. Well, then they started bringing up shields and started covering themselves in protective uh, gear and kept on coming. They were launching, uh, you know, burning logs at our people. They were sending with wrist rockets. They were launching in, again, marbles and, and the, the nuts from the end of bolts, and they were hitting, hitting our people with these. Uh, as we would launch a gas bag, they would pick up the canisters and launch them back towards us. And while you don't have audio, you can get, hopefully I've laid a good groundwork for what you're seeing here. And you can see the fire hose as they spray towards the lines. And you can see the jersey bears. You can see the, the wire. That's what we had to do to keep people back. And as you can see, they're coming at us with shields. So they weren't peaceful. They weren't prayerful. And they weren't con not, not confrontational. And every time we'd, we'd come right, they'd try to come on the left. Then they'd try to come back to the right. Uh, they'd try to come over the top. And they would come, and they would come, and they would come. And, and once we get reset back up here, uh, it, you're going to see another video is showing here where it's from, from their side. And if you, when you look, what I want you to notice is how few law enforcement officers we have on that side holding the bridge. We had a contingent there. 
and then and the reserve contingent that was on the field for us about a half mile away had to get called in. And then we had a contingent on Turtle Hill just to the west, I'm sorry, just to the east. Uh, and um, they, you know, basically were all we had to hold this. And the next video I'm going to show you here shortly once it loads up is from their side. They came at us with drones every single day. They would hover over our head. So, I mean, it really, we really had to adapt to our tactical situation because uh, they could watch what we were doing. At one point with one of the drones, they tried to take down our helicopter. They went right for the tail rotor on the helicopter, and uh, some quick moves by the helicopter saved it from being taken down. But the sheriff that was on board that helicopter said he'd never been so afraid in his life. He thought they were going down. And, uh, yeah, again, they're peaceful and prayerful. And that was constantly the message. But as you can see behind the scenes, we were literally fighting a war. And every day we were in fear for the lives of our people because we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, so once this next one uh, loads back up here, I will, I will uh, get that. In fact, here it comes. So what I want you to take a look at here, I've just stopped the plane. But if you look, uh, you will see the line of our officers. And then take a look what's over their shoulders and what they're facing all the way back. It's a good look here. Look at the hundreds of people that are swarming towards those lines. There's where they've already yanked all the barricades off. They've yanked that other truck down into the ditch there. Now, this thing, as you look, uh, that's what we had for people, very few. Uh, so they were completely under assault and, and literally scared for their lives. And you can see where we're trying to hold them back. We just tried to light up the whole area. To the left, if you look straight over the top of that, to the to the along the, you can see about three quarters of a mile away. That's the lines. That's where we have officers along there. That's the Turtle Hill area. Think about it. Look at what you're doing. And, and a lot of times what they were showing 
is how, how crazy and how radical they were, but they were showing it to us live. And a lot of times we could counter based on what we saw. So as you set up your Intel teams, uh, make sure that tracking, start identifying the major players and start tracking their Facebook pages because they are a wealth of intelligence and information. And as we uh, transition back here uh, from the video back to the slideshow, you will see um, our next uh, slide is a picture. I'm sure many of you heard about how we, um, we, we uh, blew up uh, with concussion grenades uh, this female that was on the bridge. And that is uh, the individual, she, uh, her name is Sarah. And um, they would have you believe that we were throwing concussion grenades and that she caught one in the arm. The investigation is still ongoing, so I'm going to be, I don't want to say too, too much. But you can see the damage she did to her arm. And what happened, our people saw her sneak up. The remaining five-ton vehicle that was left there, she had taken cover behind that. Now, whether she was going to use this propane bomb to throw at our lines, or whether she was trying to try to place it under that truck to blow it up, we don't know. We don't know what that intent was, but it went off in her arms. And that's what did the damage, and that's what hurt her. And we believe, you know, once the investigation, we believe, will prove that. And uh, because there was nothing we had in our, in our inventory that we would have launched at people that would do that. And, and so we'll let the investigation speak for itself on that one. Here is, as you can see, one of the, in fact, the, the next night, wait, through that night, the next day, and then all the next night into uh, Monday night, all of us that were down there ended up sleeping at the bridge. We ended up sleeping there all night, uh, going throughout the whole day into the other night because we started to receive large amount of threats that the local officers' homes were going to be firebombed, and it was a legitimate intel. And so we had to... Um, we had to take action for that. We sent every local officer and deputy home to protect their own homes. Uh, we, and they were, we had good intel that they built a number of those propane bombs and they were going to use them on our people. A big coordinated effort, and I want to emphasize coordinated effort by the militant protest group was to threaten and scare our families. They would physically say it. If they're afraid for their families, they'll leave. If they're afraid for their families, they'll lose faith in their cause. I mean, if they don't realize the oath we take and that we don't run, um, but they felt it was a concerted effort to attack our families. Often area, uh, deputies and officers and troopers in that area would be followed home. Their families would be followed. They would show up in their, in their front yards. Uh, here's an example of some of the doxing that went on. That's a, a picture of uh, there was one, if you see my name, my at my uh, birthday, we X'd out everything else, but that was my home address and with a picture of a bullet. And, you know, message sent, message received. So obviously we had to take precautions back home, uh, work with our, our area agencies to protect our families. Uh, so while that, there was that active threat on top of it, um, you had them, um, that's the slash tires on a Louisiana squad car. Louisiana set up a contingent, Sheriff Craig Weber and Sheriff... Greg Champagne sent us help from Louisiana, and that's what they got as thanks from, from the protest, slashed all the tires on their vehicles. They said on top of it, you can see they would they, the, their slingshots with marbles, nuts, bolts. They'd sling feces at us, throw large sticks at us. We saw numerous pictures of guns in the camps, and at one point they even shot at the helicopter flying over with bows and arrows. Yeah, if you can just take a look at some of that, they had a, 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 an anonymous, I mean, anonymous with the mask would, was actively threatening us as law enforcement, actively threatened our governor, actively threatened the, 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 uh, the adjutant general um, and uh, who was in charge of all the guard forces. They would openly attack some of our, I know they had issues with them trying to attack their financial accounts, opening up accounts or names. Most of us all went and got life lock on our accounts. If you have it happening and it's starting in your jurisdiction and you're going to be a person that's in the media or recognized, get protect your accounts now. Don't even mess around with it. Do it because they're going to try. Uh, and then you can just see this is an example of, of on the left there from Daniel Barber, uh, some of the things they would say. And these and we didn't get these like this only one, hundreds of these uh, where they would talk about our families. 
Uh, there was many times when we run, they would yell at us how they were going to, once we died, they were going to find our homes and rape our daughters and kill our wives. Uh, that, was an every, that was a regular occurrence uh, that they would do that. So some of the lessons learned here, and then I'm going to hand it off to, to Mark here, my co-presenter, to talk some of the media stuff. Uh, no name tags. Now, we all have policies. You know, when you're asked, you give your name, your agency. Well, I would tell my guys, give your unit number, because if they got to call and ask for that, we'll find out who they are and why. Uh, we took off their name tags. You know, myself and some of the others that were so high profile, they knew who we were anyway. So I, I sometimes have mine off, but most times I didn't care. They already knew who I was. Uh, be aware of facial recognition. They would identify our people, and then they would put wanted posters up all over social media, plaster their home addresses, plaster pictures of their family, and turn, turn, put wanted posters on our officers. Definitely wear helmets. Do not buy into this. They're not going to hurt us. If we would have not had helmets and shields on and the body armor stuff on, we would have quadrupled the number of injuries. And then discuss allowing hoods as an option for your people when it gets into the confrontational stage because once they identify who you are, it didn't matter if you were a six-month deputy, they went after you. Film all encounters. Don't mess around with this from minute one. Start telling your story, and Mark is going to hit some of that. Film every contact and download all that into a database. Mark it, date it, title it, and put it down into a database. Constantly have plenty of batteries and memory cards. We went through those like candy and, uh, and be able to document everything that happens. Make sure you have access to air assets. You have to watch from above or you will get uh, flanked. You will have them trying things. There's no way, you know, in our case, we couldn't get down into the camps without World War III. Without our air assets, we would have been really in trouble. Um, and these assets, they aid in the disruptions of the protesters' travel. Uh, make sure you know what your laws will and won't allow. We did a lot of research to determine what, under the duties and office and duties of the sheriff, can we block roadways and just hamper their travel? And we could because we knew their intent was disruption. We knew their intent was criminal because they had shown through their patterns they were going to go on private property. They were going to start fires. They were going to assault people. And we felt very confident we could do this. So we started heading them off at the pass. If you look at that picture up on the upper left part there, that's a line. We put a line across Highway 6 one day and diverted them off into the middle of nowhere. They ended up on a gravel road going out to the middle of nowhere. And then about five miles down at the next road, we, we had more officers there, so they tur couldn't turn to come north. And about five miles north of us there is where the, the access lines were at, and they couldn't get to them. And then we watched their social media, and they were very angry, very frustrated because they'd gotten bested, and they couldn't get where they wanted to go. So then that, what you'll see is you're going to see one go like this. They go kneel down in front of you, and their symbols. We'll see this peaceful, prayerful person. Look at the big bad cops in their military gear threatening her, and that's not what happened. Behind her is about 600 people that couldn't get where they wanted to go to, to go uh, commit crimes. Consider the need for alternate booking options. You got to have alternate correctional facilities lined up and assist with the large group arrests. We used every available bed in the state of North Dakota. We would bring them in. Like the one day out on uh, the big protest day, we made 141 arrests that day. Many a days we'd do 40 to 50 to 60. Uh, they would come in. We set up these temporary holding facilities. Of course, they call them the dog kennels. These were DOCR inspected and De DOCR Department of Corrections Rehabilitation, DOCR inspected, DOCR approved. We had a site, uh, we had barriers so for male, male and female. We had bathrooms, the porta potties they could be escorted to. They would get classified, they would get booked in, they would get on a bus. And in some cases, like one day, I took 60 of them here in Cass County. So they got bussed 180 miles and dropped off at, at my jail. And we used every available bed space the state of North Dakota had. Start your mobile field force training now. Uh, usually at a lot of times in the rural deputy level, uh, rural uh, ch chief level, we do not, you don't have a lot of that. Start your field force training up. You would have told us we're going to be holding field force lines a half mile long in the middle of nowhere on the prairie. Uh, a year ago, I'd have laughed at you while well, we did it. And you can see there's one here where 
you see that woman, uh, she's chewing out my captain there actually, but about a quarter of a mile behind her, a couple hundred yards behind her, is a convoy of about 120 vehicles and about 500 people. Assemble and train cut teams. This was another one of their tactics early on. They would climb up onto the equipment, vandalize it, break the glass, break the switches, cut the lines, and then one or two of them would attach themselves with these sleeping dragons onto the equipment. And you have to professionally uh, have it done. We, we went to Florida. The chief in Mandan came from a, a department in Florida, and he was able to uh, bring his teams up here and uh, train us over a period of three days, and we had about a 15-person cut team that could deploy. Engage your state and federal leadership now. Get everybody on the same page. Talk to your local, your local commissioners. Talk to your local, uh, your state and federal leadership, because uh, you're going to need everybody. Reach out to all the other law enforcement entities now, because you're going to need their help. And we had, at one point, 400 cops. We had 10 different states here in North Dakota helping us with this, and we needed every one of them. We still didn't have enough each and every day to deal. When it reached the point of 10,000 protesters, we didn't have enough to handle it. And reach out to your National Guard now. They were a godsend for us. They initially took a support role, but by the end, when it got so confrontational, the citizens of the Bismarck and Mandan area were screaming for the Guard to intervene. And we all understood the optic of the Guard in place against American citizens, the Guard in place against Native Americans. Uh, but at, at, one, at some point, we finally needed their direct support to help protect our people and to protect the community. And it really what it became down to at the end, it had nothing to do with Standing Rock anymore or the Standing Rock people. By the, the middle of the end of this, the Standing Rock people had had enough. They lost their voice. They, they, they weren't being represented right. Out of the 761 arrests that we made, 94.5% of them were from somewhere else, not from North Dakota. The number one state they came from was California. California. So that's who we were dealing with. We weren't dealing with North Dakotans. We were dealing with protesters from all over the United States and those hardcore, fully funded, fully financed um, uh, professional protesters. And many of them, they would tell us they were paid to be there. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Mark here, and then we'll close it out and try to be done by 2.30. Mark? Hey, thanks, Sheriff. Uh just real quick, I, I think that what, what the protesters were attempting to do was create commotion and violence, get the attention of the mainstream, mainstream media, blow up the social media as much as possible, and then that would bring in more money, more protesters, and it just became a cycle to the point of where for the month of last October, this little patch of county in North Dakota was the fourth biggest story in social media on the planet. So one and two were, as you can probably imagine, the presidential election. Three was the Chicago Cubs winning the first World Series in generations and generations. Number four was what was going on in the Mandan area of North Dakota. We saw at one point there were more than 100 members of the media that were there trying to cover this story. It turned into the could have had a United Nations meeting at one point. There were reporters from 14 different countries and outlets from ABC to NBC to CBS to CNN, BBC, you name it, they were there. They were covering it. And that means that as we're anticipating the next activities in the pipelines across the country, make sure that your PAOs are resourced, they're trained, they're experienced, they're ready, and that they've been involved with and are ready for a crisis situation of something that they likely have not seen and that there isn't a training course or a webinar that is ready to teach them. They've got to have that capability, and they've got to respond immediately. As the sheriff was saying, videotape it, log it, factually check it out because we can't afford to be wrong. They can put all the fake news up to see that they can, but we can't be and have it ready to go, because if you lose that information war, you'll see as the results in North Dakota, they lost about, cost about $40 million in real hard money, but it was the 
hurt to the brand of the state, the law enforcement community, to the tourism community, the education community, you name it. That still exists to this day and will, for the foreseeable future, be the remnants of what they had to deal with. Fake news is the big topic that a lot of people are talking about. This was the ground zero for fake news. They would take um, screenshots of an HBO show and that showed uh, teepees burning, and they'd say, well, here, law enforcement burned down our teepee. They would take old photos from the canine attack that didn't even happen in the United States and say, look, this is what happened to a young child who was attacked by a law enforcement canine. Absolutely incorrect. You've got to be ready to respond to it immediately. You've got to have your activities together so that you are set to coordinate your intergovernmental communication across your lines from law enforcement to state agencies to the federal government and everywhere in between. Have your external affairs ready so that you're communicating with your farm communities and, and associations, your chambers of commerce, your uh, stock growers or cattlemen's association and any other group and organization that's going to be affected by this and your citizen groups so that you can speak with one voice with as much as possible. And, you know, lastly, Consider us a resource at the National Sheriff's Association. This is just a, this is not the end of our activities to help and support law enforcement in areas where the pipelines uh, could be under protest attack in the next days and months and years, but it's a continuing activity that we will be uh, available to support you in ways necessary and learn from what we learned in North Dakota for areas that might be uh, seeing protesters coming in and doing much the same thing across the country. So please use us as, an, as a resource. Uh, we're here to help. And with that, I'll turn it back to Sheriff Laney and any questions. Thank you, Mark. And, and, and I will say this, you know, for the first two and a half months, we are freely gonna admit we got our butts kicked on social media and in the media world. Our PIOs, our local PIOs played by the rules, they didn't. Our local PIOs learned fast that this was a very, very different game. It wasn't until we had, you know, Mark and his people, uh, or Matt and Dan and Chelsea, all came, we spent probably way more time than they ever thought in their lives they would spend in North Dakota, but they spent months with us, and they were a godsend for us because we were able to finally fight them. Uh, you know, their professional media service we know was coming out of Seattle, and they were very highly funded. And, and we were finally able to, to combat that with our own experts. And, and obviously, we haven't got the time today to go into all the details on that, but I can tell you without them, we would have been in serious trouble. And uh, another part of what you'll see the logo for the Know the Truth videos, if you get a chance, uh, Google uh, Morton County Know the Truth videos or uh, Morton, you know, Know the Truth videos, Dakota Access Pipeline. And there is a, I can't remember how many, there's probably about 20, 25 of them out there. Um, they're on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and, and, and search for them that way, uh, Morton County Know the Truth videos on YouTube. And you will get to see all of those. We made, all, and we finally started turning the tide. They are seeing the truth because they were getting to see us as people. They were getting to see the, the, really the hell that we were going through and the danger and how tense it was. Uh, and every single day we worried about people going home alive. Every single day we worried about that sniper round coming in onto that hill or into our ranks on that line. There were so many radicals out there and so many threats. And, and we needed the public to understand what was happening to us. So uh, as Mark said, start prepping for that now and start planning for that. And please use them as a resource at NSA if, if you need them. And uh, with that, um, that brings us more to, the, to the conclusion of the question. I got a, a couple of different questions coming in. I'll try to get them all. David Brand again, what is the probability of this occurring again in the near future? It's already occurring, sir. In South Dakota, they already have four um, camps set up along the Keystone Pipeline route, and Nebraska is gearing up uh, also as well for a major confrontation. Keystone goes right through there. We have briefed uh, law enforcement in South Dakota just a couple weeks ago. And on April 14th, myself, uh, Mark, and some other members, uh, Jonathan from NSA, uh, went to Lincoln, Nebraska, one of my detectives, Joe Gress, and we uh, met with their attorney general, their adjutant general, and, um, 
and were able to, uh, and a, a number of their people to kind of get them up to speed. And in northern Minnesota, it's already happened. The Enbridge Line 3 is going through there. And some of the same protesters that were out at our event were are now um, been thrown out of two public meetings there. And one of their security stations at one of the pipeline offices got shot up. So it's, it's already occurring. So the probability, 100%. Uh, Mr. Newsom, what you believe was the turning point in gaining control of the protest? Uh, we finally started having the numbers. Uh, we had a number of things. Mother Nature kicked in. In early December, we got that first initial blizzard, and the camp went from about 10,000 people down to about 2,000 people, and then it got cold, and that helped us a lot. And then the media war started to change on them. They started having to try to explain all that they were doing to harm the environment. You know, we pulled away um over 41 tons over 46 million pounds of debris that they left behind and these are the people that are supposed to be protecting the water and protecting the environment it started to show them their true colors they were there for confrontation they were they were more anarchy and more confrontation than they were about anything and one posting i think summed it up the best where it said uh one it said uh you know f standing rock f the uh, f the water I'm here to fight police. And, and that's kind of what it became. So we, and then the Know the Truth videos. And then our media people were finally able to start letting the world see what these people were really about. And that their peaceful and prayerful BS was exactly that. And, and so, you know, like I said, not, you know, there was many there that were. But we didn't see them. Or we saw them, but we didn't deal with them. In fact, we'd have good conversations with them. Uh, they would wish us well. They would wish us safety. If those people were the ones that were truly there, and that's what was running the show, we wouldn't have needed 400 cops from 10 states. But those 600, that, that hostile militant element was extremely volatile and extremely dangerous. And, but that's what started finally turning, turning the key for us or, and, and turning the tide for us. Um, Mr. Flynn, what if any ongoing protest activities have needed to be addressed following the removal of the folks from the camps right now? It is quiet as can be down there. Uh, everything's buried. The pipeline workers have gone home. There's nothing for them to go after there anymore. Um, you know, the, that area this was a spring flooding area. That's why it's U.S. Army Corps of Engineer land. So in the spring, that whole area where their camp was goes underwater, and we try to tell them that. And as the melt started, it got sloppy and nasty, and we were in a race against time to clear out that 46 million pounds of debris and, and, and get the area back to normal. So for us down there right now, for the most part, it's pretty quiet. There's little things here and there, but Morton County is handling it just all on their own. Um, Mr. Giuliano, uh, where can we find removal training for the ones that chain themselves to the equipment and training for field force training? What I would say is, is reach out to uh, either anybody in your local area that has a professional mobile field force team. Um, I know our training, you know, in this case, our training came from Osceola County, Florida, because that's where the chief from Mandan had come from, and he'd commanded their field forces there. But there's a number of training companies out there. That is not a nicety. It is a necessity. Because if you hurt one of them, getting them cut off, just get ready to start writing the checks. So get that training. So Osceola County is where we got our training, uh, Osceola County, Florida. But I think if you reach out to NSA, they can put you in touch with a number of the training elements that are out there. Um, Mr. Webb, uh, besides the BIA, did you have any assistance or liaison with tribal police departments? Uh, no, just the BIA. Uh, they were there in force. Uh, they brought in about 40 or 50 officers from around the country, so there'd be a little less you know, uh, pressure on the locals uh, because these were their family and friends and a lot of these people that were out there. Uh, the director of the BIA at the time, Darren Cruzan, was in North Dakota regular. We got to know him personally, uh, and he, he became a good friend to us. He was They were the epitome of professionalism, and they did everything they can to help diffuse it. But keep in mind, north of the reservation where all this is happening, they have no jurisdiction either. Uh, so it, it was a cooperative effort. When we did the final push on February 22nd of 2017, uh, they also pushed in from the west to the east in the Rosebud camp, which was right across the river from the main one, and we were able to push everybody out of that area, and it quickly dismantled after that. By March 1st, it was pretty much a done deal, 
and the last of my deputies came home on March 24th of 2017, seven months from the day we arrived, or from that time frame, uh, our people came home. That's how long it was for us. And we had a regular presence that entire time, that entire seven months. And I'm 180 miles away, uh, which kind of shows you how big this got. So I know uh, we're, we're uh, three minutes past due here. Uh, I truly appreciate you taking the time to listen to our story. I crammed a three and a half hour presentation in 90 minutes. Uh, if, uh, you know, if there's more information you need or want, reach out to Hillary. She has direct contact with me, and uh, we'll do anything we can to get you up to speed. Uh, or also there's going to be an NSA event this summer. I know we're doing a presentation there, and we're certainly willing to, to possibly bring it to you uh, if the situation allows, and we're happy to help. Our goal with this is knowledge, help our fellow law enforcement, uh, understand what we went through and what happened. And then a big part of it is for those of you where it's about to happen and it's going to happen, uh, to try to do everything we can to get you weeks and months ahead of the fight because you have no idea what's coming at you. And we need to help when we're here to help you do that. So NSA is your conduit. Uh, get a hold of NSA. I'm a national board member and I'm happy to help in any way I can get you ready uh, for the next phase. So. I appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, tuning into our webinar, and uh, you all stay safe out there. All right. I want to thank Sheriff Laney and Mark for the webinar today, um, and thank you to everyone for participating. If you would like to receive a certificate of attendance, please click on the link that is up on your screen right now. You will receive an email after the webinar with a link to the recording and a short survey to help us get your feedback for future webinars. We really appreciate your input, so please take a few moments to complete the survey for us. And thank you all again.